ちはヒストリバフス。私の名前はニック・ホジス。私はほとんどのラスト・サムライ、あなたに提示する行為である。Okay, in all seriousness, this is a fantastic movie, covering a period in history that I don't think gets as much attention as it should. This is the story about Captain Nathan Algren, a retired American officer who was hired by the Japanese to train their army to quell a samurai rebellion. Over the course of the film, however, he begins to admire the samurai and their cause, eventually, switching sides to fight for them. But really, this is a film about the Meiji Restoration of the 19th century and how one way of life that endured for hundreds of years was coming to an end and how Japan's rebirth into the modern era was about to begin. This is The Last Samurai. By the mid 19th century, whilst the rest of the world was playing the game of empires and changing under the Industrial Revolution, Japan was still a feudal society. This is because when the Tokugawa shogunate seized power in 1603, they cut off all trade with the outside world and had any foreigner who landed on their shores instantly put to death. This policy of self isolation was put into place for fear that foreign influence would destabilize the country. Until just recently, Japan had been engulfed in a series of bloody civil wars fought by hundreds of feudal lords called daimyo. Serving each daimyo were an elite class of warriors known as the samurai. Like the medieval knights of Europe, they too were bound by a code of ethics similar to chivalry known as bushido. For over a century, the samurai battled each other in a never ending power struggle for their daimyo in order to claim the ultimate title of shogun, the most powerful of all daimyo. The military dictator and ruler of all Japan. It wasn't until Tokugawa Ieyasu proclaimed himself as shogun did the country finally know peace and was unified as one nation. But there was a genuine fear that outside influence could very well challenge the balance of power. After suppressing a bloody Christian uprising in 1638, the Tokugawa shogunate imposed a self isolationist policy called Sakoku that forbade any foreigner to enter Japan or Any Japanese to leave it. So, for over 200 years, Japan became an island frozen in time. It was still very much the same feudal society ruled by the shogun and the samurai since the 17th century. But all of this would come crashing down when, on July 2nd, 1853, four black ships were spotted off the coast heading directly to Edo Bay. It was an expedition sent by the United States to end Japan's self isolation, and leading it, Was Matthew Perry. What? <laughs> I didn't even know that. Why didn't you tell me? No, not that Matthew Perry. Commodore Matthew Perry. His mission was to force Japan to open its ports at all costs, and he landed on Edo Bay presenting the Japanese an ultimatum either to open their country up for trade, or the United States would take their country by force. Matthew Perry gave them a year to decide before leaving, promising to return with even more ships. Now, I can't even imagine the shock and panic that gripped Japan. They had never seen such ships before. I mean, it would be like the equivalent of that scene in Independence Day where the alien spaceships float over the White House. Now, what do we do? Address the nation. There's gonna be a lot of frightened people out there. Yeah? I'm one of them. True to his word, Matthew Perry returned on the 13th of February 1854, this time with 10 ships. The Japanese then had really only two options to make. The first was to go for war, which I'm sure there were plenty of samurai leaning in that direction, or accept the humiliating demands, which is of course the smart choice, and that's exactly what they did. In fact, they even took it a step further. As much as they resented the Americans asserting their dominance, Their technological advances certainly impressed the Japanese. They knew that in order to survive in this age of Western imperialism, they would have to modernize and fast. Their speed and efficiency in doing so cannot be understated. Hiring thousands of experts from Europe and North America to advise and teach, Japan was able to achieve nearly 300 years of Western technological advancement in just over 20 years. This included railroads, a modern army and navy. Factories and telegraph lines. They even adopted Western clothing, clearly stating that Japan was a modern nation, equal in power and stature to the West. 
ご神秘を増強し学校教育の充実を図ることは急務ですかろうじて絶叫の侵略を阻んでいるなアジアでは我が国だけであり But in order to do so, they had to completely change their political structure from top to bottom. The samurai were now becoming more and more obsolete by these reforms and were no longer the top class they had once been. By 1876, when the movie begins, more and more of their privileges were being stripped away as they were now not really needed in this new Japan. Tensions were running high as the samurai believed that the country was changing too fast and war for the very soul of Japan. Was about to begin. Now, you would have to be really stubborn not to see the similarities with The Last Samurai and Dances with Wolves. It's practically the same story an outsider from an aggressive, militarily expansionist civilization mingles with the technologically inferior indigenous population and grows to love them. Even fight for them. It'd be easy to stand up and shout rip off due to themes and the story it's trying to tell about the last days of a native people. Its great writing, though, goes a long way to get the audience to sympathize and feel a really high stake of jeopardy lurking over our characters. Unlike that one other really overrated movie. So, what, they're gonna kill a bunch of Smurfs in this one spot in the jungle? They have a whole planet to contend with. I'm sure there's more of them. That doesn't make sense. So, anyway, our main protagonist of the film is Captain Nathan Algren, who is an American advisor paid by the Japanese to train its new model army in modern warfare. He's loosely based on French Captain Jules Brunet, who trained and fought with the Shogun in the Boshin War seven years earlier. But you might as well not need to know that, because in actual fact, Algren's a totally different character by this point. But written in a bit more of a believable way. As much as I love Dancing with Wolves, even I have to admit that these types of films tend to follow a certain movie trope, which I like to call the white savior complex. That's basically when a native people face annihilation and a white man comes in to save the day with his awesome power of being white. But we don't get that with The Last Samurai. Nathan Algren is simply witnessing a moment in history, but is unable to shape it. The inevitability of the samurai's demise later in the film. It's clearest to him because he understands the futility of their situation in facing off against a modern army. This is drawing from his own experiences when he fought against another native people. The Emperor is most interested in your American Indians if you have fought against them in battle. We have, Your Highness. The Red Man is a brutal adversary. The Emperor wishes to ask Captain Olgren if it is true they wear eagle feathers and paint their faces before going into battle and that they have no fear. They are very brave. It's quite hard not to draw parallels between the Native Americans and the samurai. They're both an ancient people with a deep, rich culture and unfortunately stood in the way of imperialism and industrialization. This is not lost on Algren as he feels a real sense of deja vu in his new assignment. I have been hired to help suppress the rebellion of yet another tribal leader. Apparently, this is the only job for which I am suited. I am beset by the ironies of my life. What I especially like about this character is that he is a lost soul without a people to call his own, clearly tormented by guilt due to his past. Throughout the movie, we see him on a path of self destruction, smothering his nightmares with alcohol abuse. This is a punitive expedition, Captain. Colonel Bagley, these people had nothing to do with the raids. Good night. Quietly now, boys. When Olgren gets captured by the samurai, 
The film makes it clear that this is a character who wants to die and sees no chance of redemption for the crimes he has committed. Does it? Due to his imprisonment, however, he is denied his usual supply of steady booze and he regresses in a state of detox, unable to ignore the screams of the dead. Finally overcoming his alcohol addiction, he is free to walk amongst the samurai, first as an outsider, but gradually over time he begins to respect them and their way of life, finding something in them that had all been but lost to him. Everyone is polite, everyone smiles and bows. But beneath their courtesy, I detect a deep reservoir of feeling. They are an intriguing people. From the moment they wake, they devote themselves to the perfection of whatever they pursue. I have never seen such discipline. These little moments truly are the heart of the film. Bit by bit as the movie slowly progresses, we can really see the journey of Orgrin's character arc, and even understand what it is about the samurai he finds so attractive. The friendships he makes between Katsumoto and the other samurai feel real and heartfelt when he makes that ultimate decision in the end to fight for their cause, even though he knows that there is no chance of them surviving. So, it makes sense why Orgrin would want to switch sides in the first place, and at least he did it for a noble cause, unlike Jake Sully, whose reason to doing so seemed to be primarily motivated out of his curiosity and interspecies erotica. Whilst Nathan Orgrin is a completely made-up character, Katsumoto is heavily based on the real samurai rebel leader Saiko Takamori. Like Katsumoto, he also believed that Japan was changing too fast, but he was not completely against modernization. He understood the potential dangers the Western powers could inflict in Japan for not doing so. So Saigo backed up many of the social and political reforms that were going on and helped to overthrow the Shogun in the Boshin War, placing Emperor Meiji as the central figurehead in the Japanese government. One of the biggest reforms he supported actually was the modernization of the Japanese army. There are actually many pictures that could be found of Saiko Takamori wearing a western uniform. Unlike his film counterpart Katsumoto, Saiko had no problem whatsoever with using guns, and when he didn't use them, it was not for the stupid reason that the film states. Who supplies her weapons? Karara no boki wa Katsumoto wa samurai no michi wo shiru mono tachi ni agamerare te o Imasara tobi dogu wa tsukawatta ro Katsumoto no longer dishonors himself by using firearms, you see. He uses no firearms. You see, to those who honor the old ways, Katsumoto is a hero. He's also an idiot. I'm sorry, but if Katsumoto doesn't see the advantages in using projectile weapons, then he really is an idiot. Historically speaking, the samurai were never stupid enough to scoff at the idea of using guns. Well, at least the ones who survived. dishonorable to use guns. The samurai have been used to shooting each other for 300 years, so what the fuck is he talking about? Because Saigo Takamori had no problem using guns whatsoever. He outfitted the samurai rebels with guns and cannons, only to later fall back on conventional samurai weaponry when he ran out of ammunition. Now, of course, one of the biggest differences between the character of Katsumoto and Saigo were their reasons for rebelling against the imperial government in the first place. For example, with Katsumoto, his cause is highly romanticized in the movie, portrayed to be an actual service to an emperor who is really being manipulated by ambitious men like Amura. Blind to what is actually going on, where the samurai are being targeted by the government almost like an ethnic group to be ostracized and humiliated in public. The banning of the samurai's right to carry their swords was the final straw due to their cultural and spiritual significance. Now, whilst a lot of this is true, the samurai were really just fighting to protect the status of their class and their privileges, such as exemption from taxation, the right to kill a commoner if they were given disrespect, and being the only ones allowed to fight. For hundreds of years, the samurai had been used to being the top dogs in Japanese society, but now they were no longer really needed in this day and age. So it was only in the face of their class's abolition did they rise up. However, not all samurai resisted such change. During the 200 years of self-isolation, 
Japan had enjoyed a long reign of peace and prosperity. Peace and prosperity is wonderful and all for the common man, but it wasn't all that great for the samurai. The warrior class had no wars to fight, and the status of their class forbade them from taking any other form of employment because it was considered beneath them. And I'm sure many resented the fact that, whilst their form of income was fixed, the absolute bottom class, the merchants, started earning more money than them. So these social reforms actually provided many samurai a way out of their class's restrictions, allowing them to work as merchants, government officials, to serve in the armed forces, and etc. So the film's title, The Last Samurai, is a tiny bit misleading, as many of the politicians and officers who fought against the samurai were also samurai. Well, the general and Katsumoto fought together for the emperor. He fought with the samurai. He is samurai. Now, I must stress that as much as I love The Last Samurai, I have to let you know that you cannot take it too seriously within its historical context. For example, one painfully inaccurate scene is the fog battle. Apart from the fact that it, it probably didn't happen, its portrayal of the capability of the Imperial Army by 1876 is completely ridiculous. The Imperial Army had already been tried and tested during the Boshin War, yet in the movie they are completely inexperienced and can't shoot for shit, giving the impression that this is the first time this modern army has ever fought against the samurai, which just isn't true. Our men are running from the battlefield! Shame for this play! However, I do understand why it's in the movie. It obviously wants to show how formidable these samurai warriors were, even though Saigo Takamori actually lost every single battle he fought. But the film's main objective is not to present an accurate portrayal of the Satsuma Rebellion, but to give a small insight into samurai society in its last days of glory. Olgren is not only a great character, but is also a great narrative tool in the story, allowing the audience to see the simple lives of the samurai through his eyes, and the painful transitional period between feudal and imperial Japan. The final moments of the last battle in the film not only is very close to what happens in real life, but is also the perfect metaphor, marking the end of one Japan and the beginning of another, how a class of ancient warriors that ruled Japanese society for hundreds of years was cut down by the industrial age. Years of training and skill with the sword and bow cast aside for the efficiency of mass-produced weapons of war. It's an incredibly powerful scene and truly captures the spirit of the samurai. Choosing to go out on their own terms, rather than fade away from the pages of history. To die with honour, rather than live without purpose. Their sacrifice for what they believed in struck such a chord with Japanese society that Emperor Meiji posthumously pardoned Saiko Takemori, and he became a national hero. The imperial government quickly revived elements of Bushido and adopted it to become Japan's new nationalist moral code. Honour, duty, loyalty to the emperor, and self-sacrifice were all attributes of the samurai that would endure well into the 20th century. Well that about wraps it up. My name is Nick Hodges and thanks for watching History Buffs. And remember, if you like the show, help the channel grow. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. And let me know in the comments section what you thought about The Last Samurai. And of course, what historical movie should I review next? Until then, I'll see you next time.